Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. As I said, my name is Stefan Haggard. I teach at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at UCSD. And I'm pleased to co-host this National Security Policy Speaker Series with Eric Gartska, who is also online with us. Uh, this is a creation that he brought to UCSD and we're really thankful for him doing so. It's co-sponsored by his organization, CPASS, uh, my Korea Pacific program at uh, GPS, and particularly, we want to thank the Nonproliferation Policy Education Center in Washington and Henry Sokolsky, who has been really instrumental in making this uh, work. Christine? So the purpose of this series is basically to bring in speakers, including policymakers and those who have worked in the intelligence community and the national security community, to talk about their experiences in making national security policy. So one of the themes of this exercise is not just what does the United States do, but also how it does it. How do we make intelligence? How do we make public policy with respect to national security? And it's been a really great series covering a variety of topics from cybersecurity to North Korea to weapons of mass destruction. And those of you who are interested in seeing what we've done, we urge you to go to the CPAS website and take a look at, at the recordings of the past events that they're, they're really terrific. I just want to uh, highlight a few things that are coming up on the schedule, including today. Uh, this is co-sponsored, as I said, with the Korea Pacific program. And we've got three forthcoming events that might be interesting to some of you. I'm particularly proud of an event we're doing later today at four o'clock on a book by Todd Henry in the history department called Queer Korea, which is one of the first things that's been written on the LGBTQ community in Korea. It should be very interesting. We'll be joined by Jin Kyung Lee, who's in uh, the literature department, and that should be a fascinating discussion. That starts at four. Uh, tomorrow, also at four, I'll be uh, interviewing Ulrika Shada about her new book on Japan, The Business Reinvention of Japan. It's a really fascinating piece of work in business studies, but her main point is of interest to those in the security community it's, as well. The basic point of the book is that Japan is being underestimated in terms of its uh, economic capabilities. It's really a very interesting piece of work. And then for those of you who are interested in security issues, on June 8th at four, I'm going to be sponsoring a terrific round table by three people who are among the best in the country on monitoring internal developments in North Korea. Mike Madden is the founder of North Korea Leadership Watch. Uh, Dan Pinkston at Troy University, based in Seoul, watches North Korea very uh, closely. And Joseph Wright has written some of the best things in the political science literature on personalist regimes. So please feel free to join us in those, uh, in those events. Just sign up at the Korea Pacific program webinar series. So let me just uh, outline very briefly the, uh, the ground rules. All of you have been muted. Uh, it's just kind of chaotic to manage one of these webinars if we have people muting and unmuting. Please just send your questions through the chat function. Feel free to send them during Admiral Thomas's talk. We'll moderate them. If there's a clarifying question and we can get it in, I'm happy to do it. Uh, Admiral Thomas will talk for about 30 minutes and then we'll go to Q&A uh, and we'll try to get in as many questions as we can. So let me introduce our, our speaker today. Uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing uh, Vice Admiral Thomas for about three or four years now. He spent 38 years in the Navy. Uh, he's a graduate of UC Berkeley as am I. So he came in, we had some commonalities. He was a submariner. He's held a number of command positions in the Asia Pacific, uh, up to and including as commander of the Seventh Fleet uh, from 2013 to 2015. Onshore, he's held a number of positions dealing with grand strategy in the Asia Pacific, uh, including the director of plans and policy at the Special Warfare Command, the Naval Special Warfare Command, and as director of the strategy and policy division. Um, so uh, today, uh, Vice Admiral Thomas is going to talk uh, to us about the Asian alliances. Uh, Robert, take it away. It's yours. Thanks, Steph. And uh, first, let me uh, say thank you to Professor Gartsky, uh, to Christine Kearns, to yourself uh, for the invite. 
uh, for some of you who have uh, heard either a TED talk from me or um, you know some other forum, some of this will look familiar. And um, you know, back to uh, Steph Haggard and our our kind of common lineage at UC Berkeley. Uh, Steph's been nice enough not only to be a colleague over the last three years, but he's also uh, been a mentor in the sense of taking a 38-year uh, naval officer and kind of guiding him into uh, the academic world. Uh, this particular perspective was really generated uh, by Steph Haggard. He asked me to uh, write an article for Global Asia. This was almost three years ago. And he really wanted a practitioner's perspective. And for those of you who remember, this was at a time when, hey, what are our alliance structures going to look like with the new administration? Given the fact that both candidates had uh, essentially uh, said that they were not going to pursue the Trans-Pacific Partnership, there was real concern with respect to the rest of the ligatures that we were uh, involved in in the uh, Asia Pacific, what the military now calls the Indo-Pacific, and we, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but Steph asked me to write that article, and that started this kind of, I'll, I'll call it almost continuous uh, research project for me on continuing to look at the alliances, this hub and spoke in Asia, um, looking for opportunities with respect to future multilateral ligatures, and then also this uh, more recent kind of trying to bring India into the fold. And it all looks to uh, even the most casual observer as a, a bit of a pseudo containment strategy with respect to a very competitive uh, People's Republic of China. So if you don't take anything away from the discussion other than this, uh, it turns out geography still matters. Um, Professor Gartsky's done some research work on the efficacy of U.S. Uh, military as a function of distance from our shores. Keep in mind that the view I'm going to give you is a practitioner's perspective, in particular a maritime practitioner's perspective. And uh, I couldn't agree more with the conclusions of Professor Gartsky's uh, research, and it shows up here in the Asia Pacific. And I use this chart on purpose. Uh, it's a little bit dated, but it gets to this point of you don't see uh, the United States on this chart. The tyranny of distance in this region uh, really makes the military support to diplomatic efforts uh, a challenge. And so let's kind of walk around. We'll do what uh, Professor Gartsky in a younger uh, age would have called a terrain walk, but we'll do it with maritime geography. And I really want to look at, at five areas this morning. The first, obviously, uh, the Korean Peninsula. And this particular speaker series, you're talking about Korea, you're talking about uh, issues on the Korean Peninsula, but I'm going to put a military practitioner's lens on that particular issue. And, and we ought to discuss whether the United States still needs to be on the peninsula in its current form with respect to that alliance. Uh, the next stop will be the East China Sea. The East China Sea is a great maritime geography to really kind of unpack the competition between Japan and the People's Republic of China. So we'll, we'll make a stop there. Then we'll move south to the South China Sea. Again, sort of a euphemism, a maritime euphemism, if you will, for the competition between uh, the People's Republic of China and the ASEAN nations and what that competition looks like currently and where that might go. Then we're gonna move west to the Eastern Indian Ocean, 
which uh, there was a recent article that <laughs> was in one of my maritime security blogs that talked about uh, the Andaman Sea, the next South China Sea. So playing in the background should be um, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, formerly known as the String of Pearls, and some of the advancements uh, into the Indian Ocean with respect to the People's Liberation Army Navy and, uh, and also the economic ligatures that uh, China is building in the area, and then how India is going to react to those. And then finally, we're going to move out uh, to the east to Oceania. And the reason I use this chart is because you'll see all those dotted lines out there. And uh, three of the areas actually are uh, areas called the compact states, the compact of free association. This is, uh, these are sort of treaties, uh, Palau, uh, the Federated States of Micronesia, and the Republic of the Marshall Islands. And of course, you have U.S. territories in the, in the Marianas. And you say, okay, Robert, why are we worried about what's going on out there from a security perspective? Well, we'll talk about that, especially with respect to uh, the protein wars, what I call the protein wars, and, and there's been books written on on the fisheries issues out there, but also climate change. And you know, one of my former bosses, Sam Locklear, um, he took some heat for talking about climate change as a security issue years ago. Um, but I think he's right. And so when we talk about Oceania, we ought to we ought to discuss that. So let's start marching around this geography. Uh, the Korean Peninsula. As you look at Korea, especially the Republic of Korea military, there shouldn't be any doubt in anybody's mind that uh, North Korea's ability to conventionally threaten South Korea, keeping that, keep that word in mind, conventionally threaten, conventional forces, that the ROC, the Republic of Korea's military, is absolutely fully capable of handling that threat. Now, does the ROC military have some challenges in the future? Absolutely. One of them is the demographics of the population. Uh, as you know, the South Korean military relies on uh, conscription of males for a certain, certain period of time. That pool of bodies is getting smaller. Um, like many populations, uh, and not just in Asia, but in the developed world, these uh, populations are aging out. And so this pool that you can draw from for uh, your military end strength uh, is dwindling. And so uh, culturally, South Korea is going to have to look at that issue downrange. But the fact of the matter is the ROC military is very, very capable. Still dominated by an army, a ground force that is probably trying to figure out its own identity in the future. Um, a very capable Navy, although tuned to the areas around the peninsula, known as the KTO, the Korean Theater of Operations, what the Koreans would call the West Sea and the East Sea, what you would look at on this chart and say, that looks like the Yellow Sea and the Sea of Japan. But the Navy's very, very capable um, and works with the US 7th Fleet routinely. The ROC Air Force uh, works with US 7th Air Force. They absolutely are merged uh, there in South Korea, uh, particularly in places like Osan. And so there's really no question for example, uh, air superiority between North Korea and South Korea, that's a slam dunk in favor of South Korea. Where you run into some challenges on the military side is special operations forces. The North Koreans have a massive uh, soft special operations force uh, contingent. 
infiltration methods uh, in the maritime, uh, low altitude, even through the DMZ. Uh, so if you don't think that North Korean special operation forces are operating south of the 38th parallel, then you're a bit naive. That said, um, the ROC military and associated agencies are very, very good at mitigating that threat. And then it, it gets to this other issue, <laughs> the 800 pound gorilla in the room, and that is the nuclear issue and the delivery systems. And it's really about the delivery systems. Uh, Robert Thomas has been convinced for some time that uh, everybody's gonna have to learn to live with a nuclear capable North Korea. The real issue is delivery system, short range, intermediate range, and intercontinental ballistic missiles. You can't defend viably South Korea against short range ballistic missiles. There's not enough uh, capacity to get after what is a very inexpensive delivery system. And so you have to look at what the South Korean military calls the uh, proactive defense. And that may involve um, preemption. And it wouldn't be preemption so much on uh, the US part of that alliance, uh, but the South Koreans absolutely uh, have to deal with the short range ballistic missile systems of North Korea and perhaps uh, generate uh, capacity of their own. All right, so all of that aside, the current state of play with North Korea is interesting. Just an article in the Financial Times this morning that Kim Jong-un is thinking of uh, floating a bond issue to get his uh, wealthy elite to contribute, all right? Um, but uh, Professor Haggard, Professor Gartsky are much more tuned to this than I am. Um, a lot of that money uh, will go to the wrong place. It won't necessarily go to uh, supporting the uh, underpinnings of a long-term economy in the North. Uh, I just don't see the situation from a military perspective changing very much. Uh, and then finally, I would argue that um, we have to look at, given ROC military capability, uh, how much we still want to uh, push uh, U.S. troops on the peninsula. If it was Robert Thomas today, I would move to more of an offshore balancing strategy. Uh, I would take the U.S. 8th Army and make it much, much smaller as far as a footprint in South Korea. I think that uh, people in South Korea are uh, probably a little bit tired of uh, ground forces that, that frankly are probably unnecessary. The U.S. 7th Air Force, I'd absolutely keep them on the peninsula. Their synergies with the ROC Air Force make perfect sense. And when I mean offshore balancing, I don't just mean the ROC Navy and the U.S. Navy. I mean the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force out of Okinawa, which has a very, very close relationship with the ROC Marine Corps. And then you have to kind of uh, curb your appetite as to what you want this military to do. You really want it to blunt a North Korean aggression long enough for help to arrive. And, and the US ROC Alliance, that's what it's trained to do. Let's not ask it to do too much. From the political perspective, I think it is important to keep a US commitment on the peninsula because there's a country that's watching it very, very closely. And that, of course, is Japan. If you absolutely pulled out of the rock us alliance from a military perspective, then you would have this situation where in Northeast Asia, uh, military to military, Japan would be very much 
uh, isolated in that sense. And so despite the uh, challenges of the South Korean, Japanese political uh, tensions, uh, the military to military to military, the trilateral military aspects of it are act actually quite healthy, especially in the maritime. The ROC Navy, the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force, the Kaijo Jietai, and the U.S. 7th Fleet. It's also true uh, with respect to the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force. Okay, so there's kind of an assessment of the Korean Peninsula, and let's move on to the East China Sea. The East China Sea is all about the equidistance line that was agreed to back in 2008 between the People's Republic of China and Japan. And then the subsequent nationalization of the Senkaku Islands, or if you're on the Chinese side of this equation, the Dayus, uh, down in the Southwest Island chain, the, at the end of the Ryukyu is almost down to Taiwan. Um, so you've got this pushing and shoving that goes on in the maritime environment. Uh, first of all, there was a joint gas field exploration agreement along that equidistance line. On the Chinese side, you'll see 12 to 14 platforms for uh, natural gas extraction. On the Japanese side, you see zero. So that's interesting. Is it because the Japanese have just decided to take a pass? No, it's, it's really a kind of a maritime, don't change the status quo uh, warning uh, from the People's Republic of China. Uh, over the last, really since 2009, uh, when uh, the People's Liberation Army Navy and then what became the Chinese Coast Guard, remember the Chinese Coast Guard used to be five or six different maritime law enforcement elements. And uh, over a decade ago, they brought that under a very tight controlled Chinese Coast Guard, very professional. Uh, the command and control of it is impressive. And um, so when you're in the maritime, you see uh, sort of a three-wave attack, if you will, if you're looking at it from a, hey, here's an adversary. Uh, it's the Chinese fishing fleet shows up, and remember, in, interleafed in that is uh, the maritime militia. And then right behind it is the Chinese Coast Guard. And behind that over the horizon is the People's Liberation Army Navy. And in the East China Sea, what's so interesting is this equidistant line, um, the Chinese will routinely operate on the Japanese side of that line. The Japanese tend to not operate on the Chinese side of that line. The Japanese have done something very interesting to show resolve, and that's uh, they have increased their Coast Guard capacity in the Southwest Islands down around the Senkakus. And remember, these are uninhabited islands, uh, strategically rather unimportant, but um, absolutely a flashpoint. The Japanese have decided, hey, we will keep as best we can a two to one capacity advantage with respect to the Chinese Coast Guard in and around the Senkakus. The violations of territorial waters, the violations of territorial airspace, those are routine. Uh, the Japanese react to it. Uh, and what's so interesting is long-term, you look at uh, the Chinese strategic uh, perspective, they've decided in the East China Sea, hey, this is, uh, a capacity-driven kind of attrition effort, and, and they'll just wear the Japanese down. And, uh, and maritime claims and maritime incursions are interesting. If you don't challenge them, they tend to become a given. It's the new status quo. And uh, the People's Republic of China is very, very good at that strategic play. And they also uh, use that strategic play down in the South China Sea. 
if you look at the UN Convention on Law of the Sea, and then you look at the nine dash line, this is the claim that the South China Sea is really um, territorial waters or effectively uh, Chinese territory. Um, you'll see that the nine dash line is absolutely uh, opposed to the UN Convention on Law of the Sea. And what's so interesting there in the South China Sea is that you have the Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei, Vietnam, Indonesia to a lesser extent. All of those countries have maritime claims in the South China Sea. All are signatories, including China, to the UN Convention on Law of the Sea. The Philippines even uh, you know, conducted an arbitration case um, and the International Justice Court back in 2014-ish um, actually ruled in favor of the Philippines in that, hey, their EEZ, their exclusive economic zone was being violated uh, by the Chinese. The Chinese who are signatories to the UN Convention on Law of the Sea said, thank you very much, but we're uninterested in that judgment and have carried out uh, what I call a pressurization campaign, something that I you know, witnessed firsthand, not just when I was still going to sea, but of course, when I was the Seventh Fleet commander. And that coupled with you know, digging up sand and coral and building uh, islands, if you will, um, in the South China Sea has created this uh, pressurization, this kind of steady accumulation of advantage. And ASEAN nations uh, and, in this case, their US ally, in the case of the Philippines, um, haven't figured out a good response. We don't have a good response. We dutifully conduct these freedom of navigation operations, which is, uh, I think, whistling in the wind. And uh, it's an effort to kind of focus everybody on the UN Convention on Law of the Sea. But I'm not sure that that many, other than the real, the people who are really into the maritime legal aspects of it are listening. All right, well, let's, uh, in the interest of time, let's move on to the uh, Eastern Indian Ocean. And this one's become very, very interesting. As you come out of the Strait of Malacca into the Andam Andaman Sea, where it says Bay of Bengal, that used to be uh, essentially uh, India's maritime space. That is no longer. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative has created a set of strategic ports, if you will. Uh, one of them is in Colombo, Sri Lanka. Uh, and the People's Liberation Army operates, I'm sorry, People's Liberation Army Navy operates uh, in the Indian Ocean now um, on a regular basis and with significant capacity. As those who kind of keep track of maritime military balances look at this, um, the Chinese footprint in the Indian Ocean is uh, significantly larger, all the way from Sri Lanka, the Maldives, uh, on into Djibouti. You know, uh, as you get into the Arabian Sea and the all the way to uh, the Red Sea, and uh, it's, it's both military capacity, but it's also this economic um, capacity that China brings. And it's very well integrated. When you look at it from a strategic perspective, it's, it's absolutely Alfred Thayer Mahan uh, in the 21st century. It, it, Xi Jinping is a Mahanian creature in that sense. And it's extremely well integrated and well executed. So we should talk a little bit more about that. Finally, Oceania, this area that sits out where you see Palau and Micronesia on your chart. Um, here's the real concern from a security perspective. Climate change also begets more and more extreme weather. This part of the world gets more natural disasters in the form of earthquakes, tsunamis, super typhoons than any other part of the world uh, per annum. And um, 
it's so it's not getting better. And so you spend a lot of your security dollars now on humanitarian assistance disaster response. That is absolutely the right thing to do, but it is a capacity issue. Australia, New Zealand, the United States, uh, other countries in the region are getting tapped out with respect to how much response you can generate. And it's only gonna get worse. I, I talked to a colleague at Berkeley and, and she said to me, Robert, okay, so it's not just extreme weather. It's not just the fisheries issue, uh, the protein wars out there and uh, these small island nations trying to protect their exclusive economic zones. Um, it is global warming such that the rise in sea level is not gonna create environmental refugees in the thousands. Eventually this is gonna be in the millions. Then what? And so this becomes an absolute security issue where a multilateral solution, uh, we're begging for a multilateral solution if we look long-term. So with that, let me, you know, so we've walked around kind of five geographic areas, all kind of maritime geography. I've said a few things that should irritate uh, people in the audience so that we can evoke the appropriate amount of discussion. Uh, and then uh, I'll try to stay in my swim lane uh, for this discussion of military practitioner, but more than willing to, to dive into anything. Over to you, Steph.